Lynch, I got asked to introduce Stephanie, which is an honor for me because I hadn't met Stephanie from the Wilmette area, North Shore group, and she's going to talk on rhythm, my, one of my favorite topics. That's hard, and it's very frustrating for teachers. Board in here, which is really, really good. She's performed all over China, seven concerts in seven days, yeah. she said. Wow. And um, rhythm is very, 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 very important. If you don't have rhythm, I don't think you have music. You just have. Yeah, yeah thank we'll you. Find out. We'll find thank out you, thank you, thank you. So it's my great privilege to introduce to you Stephanie Quinn. I've been looking forward to discussing the topic, The Truth About Rhythm, and the subtitle is, You Can't Beat It. I gave a talk at my local chapter on teaching rhythm in sight reading. During the rhythm part of the section, I must have said some provocative things because some of the members wanted to know more and even encouraged me to present at this conference. And so it is, and I thank you all for joining me here at the Illinois State Music Teachers Association Concert 2013. First, I will share how I teach rhythm to my students. I will also take you deep into outer space with facts that prove that the world is sound. Sound is caused by movement, vibration, frequencies, and thus rhythm. This is the truth, and you can't beat it. I will tell you how, this facts, how these facts relate rhythm to our bodies, with our planets, rhythm with our moon, its overtones, even with mental health, and with Pythagoras' ideas on five, and with water. It is my hope that these facts will deepen your understanding of the connection between rhythm and our outer environment and our inner lives. To clarify some of the scientific data I speak of, we will see rhythm and sound in action in my PowerPoint presentation at the end. After that, we open the room to questions and discussion. Briefly, I'd like to go over a few points on teaching rhythm. Now, my teacher was William Browning, often told me that many teachers, even at the conservatory level, failed to convey the correct understanding of rhythm. Back then, I couldn't believe it. However, as a professional piano and violin instructor, his words have proven true. Most of my intermediate or advanced transfer students exhibited poor rhythm when they first auditioned for me. In my years serving on competition juries, I have seen time and time again the career crippling effects of wonderfully talented children performing works far beyond their rhythmic ability. Poor rhythm causes sloppy technique and missed notes. We, as teachers, must impart rhythmic skills early on, the reason being that it's difficult to reverse poor rhythmic training. Now, when I'm teaching a first lesson to either a piano or violin student, I begin by defining exactly what a measure is. A measure is called a measure because it measures time. Each measure must take the exact amount of time to play as the next measure and the next measure and so on. I insist we both count out loud while copying the pieces before we play them. Time is measured in sound and silence. Sound in notes, silence in pauses. I allow my student to vocalize the count first and while they're counting, I immediately follow, almost like it's an echo, so that there's no chance that the student copies me. If I stop counting with my student, this lets them know they've made a mistake. And I wait for a correction. If there's no correction, I begin with a series of questions, forcing my student to reason through the process. I use Socratic style of teaching. Now, when a student begins playing eight notes, it's best to count all the ends, so as to give each chord the full amount of time. For the very young, I use the Kodaly method, the ta and the titis. Now, for counting out loud, you can make it fun by using bongo drums. Of course, we can clap our hands or even clap our knees. I like to see rhythm internalized in the body as in walking, bike riding, or swimming a front crawl. I 
encourage my students to mentally run through a piece that they've memorized and use their physical activity and the rhythm of it as their metronome. So what about the metronome? Now, in some cases of special needs students, I use a metronome to coordinate walking to a steady beat, but not applied directly to the playing the music. The point is to get the body moving in a regular and steady rhythm. For my other students, I do not use a metronome until the student is technically advanced to perform at a rapid speed or tempo. Now, before we finish the part about teaching rhythm, a few words about the rest. When I explain the rest symbol, I use the word pausa rather than rest because I don't want my students to rest or relax their focus. English is the only language where we define that symbol as a rest. In Croatia, in Czechoslovakia, Danish, German, Greek, Italian, Norwegian, in Polish, in Portuguese, in all those languages, they use words deriving from the word pause, pausa. Silence is part of the music and part of the rhythms of life. The truth about silence and music is that a pause is not a time to rest or take a nap. I cannot emphasize the importance of telling your students to count out loud. Sell this to your students and the parents. Enforce it, make them sign a contract, whatever it takes. And I've done all of that. Even called between lessons in the first few weeks. Your students will be better off for it. They'll be better off for it. And I'm telling you, make them count out loud because if you want truth and rhythm, count out loud and you can't beat that. Now, we're going to use our imagination and compare two performances of the same piece. Let's say a five minute long composition. Now, both performances are equally correct in style, technique, and completed with personality and passion. The audience was a typical one, musically untrained, and simply interested in some entertainment. One performance earns an enthusiastic applause, and the other receives a courtesy applause. The first one has a wavering, unsteady tempo on and off through the piece, five omitted crouches, not wrong crouches, omitted crouches, and uh, during scale passages. And the note accuracy was 99% accurate. The second performance was the rhythm was perfect, a number of missed chords, and even dissonant notes in the melodies. And the retardandos were artfully executed. So let's choose which one was the better one, which one earned the, the applause, and soon we'll discuss why. Now remember, both performers were equal in technique, style, and both played with great expressiveness and passion. So who thinks the audience loved the first one? Raise your hand. Well, since it's a talk about rhythm, we know. Yeah. We're going to raise our hands on the second one. Yay! Well, you're all right. And even with the missed notes, the passion and the excitement of the piece reached the audience. Would you like to know why? The other performance just didn't quite sit right with the audience? We'll explore this today. As I train for orchestral auditions, I'm a violinist, by the way, I learned that a tiebreaker is often the one with the better rhythm. Over the, over the years, my curiosity grew as to why audiences responded better to performances with better rhythm. And I craved to know why rhythm is so important. My research in Egypt and my own experiences using music and tones for reconciling people in conflict offered some intriguing answers. Everything in the world is sound, and sound is vibration. And vibration has pulse which is rhythm. Even a pitch of 440 cycles per second, 440 hertz. That's a pulse and creates a pitch of A, the A above little c. There are rhythms of the body, rhythms of the planets, and of course pitches and frequencies and rhythms at various speeds. Even the phi, or the golden proportion, is significant to know when we consider the truth about rhythm and music. When you see beauty in both art and music based on the feed, well, you can't beat perfection. Let's start with our body rhythm. 
our heartbeat, respiratory system, the movements of our various organs and functions of our body, all have rhythm. We talk at about the metronome marking of 100 on the crotchet. So our pace would match a piece with 4-4 four, four time signature. And the respiratory system is cause, causes us to breathe in and out 10 to 20 times a minute. To me, this would be a slower music with a 2-2 two, two time signature. Two crotchets receiving one slow count. A fertile woman ovulates 12 times a year. The liver is in constant motion with blood flowing a certain amount of liters per kidney, or, sorry, per minute, and the kidneys at about 1.2 liters per minute. And speaking of blood, let's not forget the heart. The heart beats to the rhythm of what a 3-4 time signature indicates, and the tempo average is 60 to 70 beats a minute, or metronome 60 on the crotchet. Its beat is crotchet, crotchet, pause, crotchet, pause, and so forth. When we hear music with the rhythm right on target, we feel good in our bodies and in our emotions. When the rhythm is off, there's a subtle jarring of our senses. What is interesting is that a musically uneducated audience is very much affected. They didn't understand why the music didn't sound good. They just said, I didn't like it too much. Or, I was bored. Now, as a performer, the last thing we want to do is bore our audiences, right? This is something you can speak to your students about. Pitch frequencies are the rhythm and tones and creates a pulse. I love the pulsating effect of overtones. When I was living in New York City, I stumbled across overtone singing. I heard the David Pike's Men's Choir sing in overtones. You can Google that guy. Uh, H-Y-K-E-S, David. And quickly taught myself how to do it. I was told it was impossible for a woman to do it because women don't have the necessary Adam's apple in our throats. I proved this wrong and crossed the gender barrier. Some say I was the first woman to do this here. Anyway, I was singing overtones every day and getting quite a buzz from it. Later, I learned with all my overtone singing and toning ancient Egyptian vowel combinations, I was sending rhythmic vibrations to the pineal gland in my brain. The pineal gland is about 8 millimeters long and produces a serotonin derivative, melatonin. As we age, calcium, phosphorus, and fluoride deposit and become compacted in the pineal gland. I wonder if all that rhythmic overtone singing shook things up in there and slowed down the deposits. Who knows? It may have extended my lifespan. Well, you can't beat that, can you? Now basically what I do in overtone singing is I sing two tones at the same time, the root pitch and also an overtone. So essentially I'm singing a chord. I also move from one overtone to the next while sustaining the root pitch and create songs this way. Move the root pitch up here and do the overtones like this. Knowing how the vibrations and rhythms of overtones is knowing about it is practical. It informs us where our commonly used scales originate, and also what causes a flute to sound different than a violin when each are sounding the same pitch. Basically, for every tone that is created, there exists a series of overtones that we hear all at once. They're very faint, and it takes training to pick out the particular overtones, but the different strengths of the mixture of the overtones is what tells us we are hearing a trumpet instead of a piano or a voice. And I teach all my students how to hear overtones. In the PowerPoint presentation, I will show you many images to help you understand <coughs> overtones better. If you'd like to take notes, this would be a good time to do so. If you don't know much about overtones and scales, here are a few inter uh, interesting facts about overtones. Number one, the most audible overtones of any scale add up to its major chord when played out loud the tonic, the fifth, and then the third. So the first four, for example, here, first we have the octave, and we have the fifth, and then the fourth, and the C major scale. So this, the major chord is found in the um, 
first few overtones in the series. Now, if I play two notes together on a violin, two different notes, I will listen for the third overtone. If it's not there, I missed the note. On a piano, the notes are right there ready for us to play, and if the piano's in tune, this is a lot of fun. On a violin, we have to create and tune each and every note we play, and this is not a lot of fun. It takes years of practice to consistently hit the notes in tune. I heard once a slowed down recording of Itzhak Perlman performing a long 16th note passage, and even he was adjusting every few notes to tweak them in tune, even at that lightning speed. If I didn't teach my students how to hear the overtones, none of them would play in tune. Now, if you write out the overtones of the tonic, dominant, and subdominant notes in the C major scale and string out the first three audible notes of each following the pattern above within the span of an octave, you will get the major scale. For example, if you want to jot three rows, the top row, tonic C. The overtones are C, G, E, and B flat. And then dominant G, the overtones are G, D, B, and F. The subdominant, F. The overtones are F, C, A, and E flat. Now, if you look in this column and you look at where all those note names are, you'll easily see where the C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C scale is right in there. Now, where's the minor scale? If you substitute the weakest notes of the scale, the third, the sixth, and the seventh note of the scale with another three notes, which includes the even weaker next overtones, which are flatter, you get the minor scale. The seventh note is the strongest of the three because it forms no complex relations with the adjacent, adjacent notes in the scale. If you leave out the weaker notes, the third and the seventh, then you have created the Chinese scale, known as the pentatonic, five-note scale, found in Africa, old Scottish and Irish folk music, and so forth. In the PowerPoint, I will show you Pythagorean's concept of the music of the spheres. Is anyone familiar with the concept of the music of the spheres? Anybody know what's happening? Good. <laughs> I hate to be telling you all something you all know already. Um, the uh, it's also been referenced as the cosmic octave, as well as the great scientist Johannes Kepler's laws of planetary motion, as he describes the relationships of planets and their orbits through numbers and rations. Kepler even used them to create geometric figures of two and three uh, dimensions, and he strove to create a symphony of the cosmos, stating that the movements of the heavens are nothing except a certain everlasting polyphony. Sir Isaac Newton was likewise inspired by the cosmic music of the ancients, as written in Proposition 8 of his Principia. I'd like to share an idea I've been researching ever since I studied, or ever since I discovered that orchestras are tuning higher and higher. It relates to the decline in our society and also part of how the great composers from uh, and created ingenious works that stand the test of time. The Tally, Bach, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, Dvorak, Brahms, and, and more all these profound masters of music. In 1885, the Austrian government recommended the A to be at 435 Hertz. However, prior to this time, it was much lower. Hertz is the cycle of the number of cycles per second. In 1926, the American music industry reached an informal standard of A440 Hertz. Ten years later, in 1936, the American Standards Association officially established the A440. The standard was taken up by the International Organization for Standardization and in 1955 accepted that A would be tuned at 440 Hz. And this pitch was reaffirmed in 1975. Yet, despite the fact that an international standard has been accepted, orchestras have been deviating ever since. And I point out to you they are deviating in the direction to raise the pitch, not lower, to what was done before 1885, the time of Brahms' final compositions. Now, when I found out about this, at first I thought, okay, the world is moving faster. Uh, technology, cell phones, television, 
it makes sense that the music would vibrate faster. Well, I was wrong. In 1989, over a dozen of operas, greats, and superstars, including Lucindo, Domingo, Luciano Pavarotti, and Birgit Nielsen, added their names to a petition before the Italian government, asking them to lower the standard pitch at which all orchestras are tuned, recommending to lower it to 432, close to the 1885. There were many reasons, including the pending extinction of the color, the true color, of the mezzo-soprano voice. Now, today, in the United Kingdom, orchestras are faithful to the 440. However, in continental Europe, the frequency of A is commonly 442, 443, and reportedly the Berlin Philharmonic is now at 445. The rising pitch trend spread to the United States as the Boston Symphony is at 444, the New York Phil Philharmonic um, 443. The general idea is to grab the audience's attention with a brighter sound. However, this causes injury to some wind players as their instruments are easier to play at the 440. It is interesting to note, in India and Tibet, the basic note has always been in harmony with the rotation of the Earth and the Moon in our solar system. In the period instrument movement, a consensus has risen about, about a, around a modern Baroque pitch of 415, currently G sharp, which is much lower than the 440 hertz A. Is this because Baroque instruments sound better when tuned this way? So I'm asking, why not tune the orchestras down instead of up? Wouldn't we be closer to the original intent? I will tell you that back in the early 90s, I experimented by playing some familiar classical and Baroque works on an electric piano solar tune to G, um, to G sharp to 415. I was struck at the different emotional hues and tones these classical works offered. And it opened a whole new insight into the heart of Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, the samples I played there that afternoon. I spent several months experimenting. I even tuned my violin down, but unfortunately, it just grunted. <laughs> you know, modern violins are not, they're set up with 440. I spent months experimenting with this. Are modern tunings avoiding harmony with Pythagoras' music of the spheres? Anyone here notice in the last 25 years, recorded classical music often has tempos much faster than prior to 1980? Do you ever notice what's going on? My piano teacher, Browning, was a protege student of Carl Friedman, who was Clara Schumann's best pupil, her protege. Clara studied with Johannes Brahms, and everyone here knows what close friends Johannes and Clara were. Browning was adamant, adamant about performance tempos, always to be faithful to the composer's intention. Having my piano teacher as a direct line to Brahms was very cool. Brahms was the last composer to compose with the A415 hertz. So we are talking about the trends in speeding up rhythm, both in, uh, in tempo and in pitch. I have a theory to share about its effect on our society. I don't know what happened first, the chicken or the egg, but something is going on. And since the world is sad, I think we need to take a close look at the music. I mentioned earlier the International Organization for Standardization affirmed the pitch to be 440A in 1955. I have noticed since 1975 a large part of our society has been in decline, and it seems to have started around 1955. Between 1955 and 1975, I observed two major progressions, and I related to some of the trends in music. One progression is what appears to be an epidemic of depression with the advent of the first antidepressant around 1955, which in the early days was very difficult to obtain. By the 1980s, people with only a couple of symptoms could easily get psychotropic medications. The other prog uh, progression was the advent of the birth control pills in the late 50s and by 1975 had spread worldwide. As a culture, many lost their innocence and became promiscuous 
resulting in the breakdown of the family structure. What has this to do with music? We enjoy exquisite expressions of the human emotional tones and even spiritual joy in the repertoire of the musical giants of the classical era. Years ago, radio music was dominated by music of the cheerful, upbeat, Broadway musicals and the oldies, and even symphony halls were filled. What has changed in the rhythm, in the pulse, in the very heartbeat of our society? I would like to return to the 440 Hertz A or even the 415 G sharp. And I would also like to hear more contemporary songs composed in the upbeat major keys. In pop culture, I find it fascinating that since 1965, the average contemporary song became longer, slower, and the share of major key songs dropped from 85% of pop hits to only 42% in 2012. Pr Professor Glenn Schellenberg of the University of Toronto conducted an important study on this. Songwriters prefer to write not in the happier major keys, but rather in the depressive minor keys. At the same time, more and more of the population are desperate to try the latest mental health medication. Plus, many of the shootings are blamed on untreated mental illness. Is all music in a minor key destructive? Certainly it is not. It is not. And it depends how masterful the music is composed and the rhythms accompanying the minor key melodies. In classical and Baroque music, we hear minor keys. However, I suggest these immortal composers composed in harmony with the universe, actually created on Earth the music of the spheres. The masters wrote music that offers us hope, reconciliation, and every piece resolves, and there's a resolution. It doesn't leave us hanging out to dry, wondering what are we going to do. In New York City, I was part of an organization who wished to change our national anthem from, uh, to, to, from what it is to Beethoven's Night's uh, Symphony Finale, commonly known as the Ode to Joy. I think this music better represents the desires of our founding fathers and what our dear country offers the rest of the world. Most of the contemporary rap music and pop songs leave many feeling hopeless and unable to deal with the negativity of the world. When scientists have experimented on the effect of music on plants, they discovered something amazing. When plants are independently suggested, the three kinds of music, classical music, rock and roll, and classical East Indian, the roots and the leaves grow strongest in one of those groups. Let's have a show of hands. Who thinks they grow strongest with the classical music? That's what I thought. Okay. What about the rock music? Uh, uh, heavy metal? Uh, it was actually the classic Indian, um, in classical Indian music, which has a lot of tonalities with the perfect force and the perfect this. I grew up with a saying, maybe you did too, music makes the world go round. Anyone ever hear this? What is this music of the spheres anyway? Pythagoras, as ancient legend has it, could hear the music of the spheres and discovered that consonant musical intervals can be expressed in simple ratios of simple integers, the phi, P-H-I. This concept was transferred by Plato and others into models about